What is up guys? We are back with part three of our Apocktober lore readings. If you guys are just joining us now, be sure to catch up with the previous parts that I've written so far. We're nearing the end of October, which means the beginning of this story is just about coming to a close. My goal for this month is to wrap up the call to action, as it were. And if enough people are interested, maybe I'll try to put the time into turning this into something like a web series, novel, or a comic. But for now, Claire and I are working on putting together a pitch bible for the story I've written so far, and the assorted illustrations that we've done to go along with it. Before we dive into this week's reading, I would of course like to devote a little time to showcasing some of my favorite Apocktober pieces done by you guys based off of my prompt list for this month. If you want a chance to have your work featured in the next video, be sure to share it and tag it on Instagram with hashtag Apocktober. Alright, like always, we got a lot of reading to do, so I'm not going to waste any more time. Enjoy the next chapter of At Benefit and Benevolent. Part 4. Catharsis and a Key The clock face resting high atop the side of Tom's automobile manufacturing plant now read 36 minutes past the hour of seven. Celeste was standing on the steps leading up to the entranceway into the factory, alongside a crowd of her fellow workers and mingling civilian spectators. They were watching paramedics hoist a black body bag into the back of an ambulance, and murmurs of concern and confusion echoed throughout the rabble. So much had happened in the past half hour since she had been confronted by Victoria Brand at the riverbank that Celeste felt as if two days had passed each bringing some new trauma that would surely haunt her for as long as she lived. After breaking free from the officer and the throngs of onlookers that had witnessed the bizarre attack under the bridge, Celeste had hurried to the factory to begin her shift. She punched her card, the machine indicated that she was well over 15 minutes late, and assumed her place in the assembly line where she was to secure rivets into engine chassis as they rolled down the conveyor belt. She had not expected to be spared any sort of reprimanding from the floor manager, Thornton Calmore, and sure enough, no sooner had she taken up her rivet gun did the bald, pot-bellied beast emerge from his overseer's office to make an example of her in front of the entire factory. Celeste was somewhat used to this. Mr. Calmore openly despised Celeste, feeling like she was entirely undeserving of her position at the factory, and made a persistent effort to keep the other workers aware of his opinions. You've got no right slinking onto my floor 15 minutes after you were called to your station, he bellowed, making every effort to be as theatrical as possible. He waved his arms, jabbed and pointed at the air, then looked around to make sure that he had attracted the attention of the other workers. Once he was sure a good number of people were listening, he continued, To think that I was fool enough to be swayed into giving you this job. I went against my better judgment, I did. Knew this was no place for a soft-handed little girl. You're taking good work from honest white men. That's what you're doing. And after all your granny sacrificed, all the favors she called in to get you this job, you stroll in here with a blatant disregard for my authority. He continued on like this for some time, managing to rally the other workers into a murmur of discontent. Celeste had tried her hardest to ignore Calmore, to focus on her work in hopes that he would eventually tire himself out. But just as he began to wind down from his rant, he abruptly reached out and grabbed Celeste's wrist. And on top of everything else, you have the audacity to waste company time and resources. He had seized her arm holding the rivet gun, and was now jabbing a grease-stained finger at the chassis she was currently assembling. I can't very well do my job while you hold my arm like that, sir. Celeste grumbled, not trying to mask her irritation. Calmore gave out a dry, humorless laugh. Oh, aren't we cute? You've got bigger stones than half the men in here, Mason. I'll give you that. But just how long did you think you could get away with sabotaging my factory before I caught on? I can't imagine what you mean, Mr. Calmore. Celeste replied, not taking her eyes off the half-finished chassis in front of her. Calmore let out a snarl of frustration and wheeled Celeste around, still grasping her tightly by the wrist. 
How many rivets were you instructed to secure into the chassis on each side, girl? He growled, and spit flew from his lips as he spoke. Four per side, sir, Celeste replied flatly. And how many have you used for this one in front of you? Celeste wrenched her arm free from Calmore's grip, and held her rivet gun upwards menacingly. Eight, sir, she hissed. There was no point in lying. Aha! She admits it. Intentionally ignoring my direct instructions and costing this company a fortune in wasted materials. Calmore's voice carried over the sounds of machinery echoing throughout the plant, and the workers started to look up again. Mr. Calmore, sir, Celeste interjected in what she knew was not at all a respectful tone. Four rivets on each side of this chassis will not be sufficient in supporting the weight of the engine once it's been lowered into the automobile, she explained. You may think that you're saving money, but it's at the cost of the lives of your consumers. Don't try and tell me how to do my job, you lying little nag, Calmore bellowed over her. Those people understand the risks of investing in a piece of machinery as dangerous and unpredictable as an automobile. Ain't one on the road today that won't combust at the drop of a hat. We're not doing anything none of the other manufacturers wouldn't. And those sheep out there don't know, and they don't care. Don't they? retorted Celeste, now raising her voice as well. Well, why don't we ask them, huh, Thornton? She took a step towards him, and was not surprised to see him move away from her as she did so. She was taller than he was, and with her rivet gun held forward in one hand like a pistol, she looked fairly intimidating. You want to fire me, you old troll? Go ahead. I'd like nothing better. But the moment I walk out of this place, you can be sure that I'll make my way right over to the journal, and they'll have it on tomorrow's front page that Tolmes is cranking out half-cocked death machines designed to save the company money at the expense of innocent lives. She was shouting now, and some of the other men had stood up in response to this outburst. There were cries from the workers, but Celeste couldn't quite distinguish what they were saying over the clamor of the machinery and an ever-intensifying pounding in her chest. For a moment, Calmore looked genuinely scared. He had taken several steps away from Celeste and was eyeing her nervously, evaluating the legitimacy of her threat. But within an instant, he composed himself and resumed his aggressive, authoritarian demeanor. You think you can threaten me, Mason? He growled, taking a hesitant step towards her again. It's your word against mine. You think the folks over there at the journal are going to believe some no-good little sneak over a successful businessman like myself? No, they'll write you off like they did your treacherous old witch of a grandmother. Then, a look of revelation washed over Calmore's face, and he grinned maliciously. Say, I got a better idea than drowning your little story. How's about I pin the mess on you? Might get me out of a jam later on down the road if someone gets wise to our cut corners. A good-for-nothing black girl what stole her job out of the hands of a man who deserved it, sabotaging our honest work here at Tomes. Now there's a story the journal would print. Celeste may have been unnerved by this new threat, but in that moment, something happened that made her forget about everything Calmore was saying. The shouts of the men around them had penetrated the din of the factory and were now being registered by Celeste. She looked up and saw to her horror what they had been trying to point out. Above her and Calmore, a half-constructed automobile that had been suspended from chains to await further assembly was swaying precariously. Celeste gasped as she noticed the engine testing the strength of its poorly fabricated chassis. Instinctively, she dropped her rivet gun and lunged towards Calmore, attempting to pull him out of harm's way, but he leapt backwards, looking furious. Don't you touch me, girl! He roared, swinging his arms violently. You'll learn your place in my factory and in this city if I have to throw you in jail and get it through your thick skull. He rolled up his sleeve and began advancing towards her again. Now it was too late for Celeste to do anything more. It was all she could manage to take a single step backwards as the sound of the chassis snapping rang sharply throughout the floor and the engine it housed plummeted like a comet down onto Calmore with a sickening crunch. The next thing Celeste was aware of was the sound of sirens outside and the rush of footsteps as the workers gathered in a huddled mass around Celeste and what had once been Thornton Calmore. There were mixed reactions from the group. Some men sounded as if the whole ordeal was somewhat funny to them, 
Others seemed genuinely upset, and some were hissing maliciously and casting accusing looks at Celeste, as if she had somehow willed the engine to fall. Now she was standing on the steps to the factory, unaware of when or how she ended up outside, and watching the paramedics drive away with the remains of Calmore's mangled body. The murmurs and whispers died out as the ambulance disappeared around a corner, and all eyes in the crowd surrounding her turned toward Celeste. There was a tense, unnatural silence that held in the air as the men of Tom's automobile manufacturing plant glared at her, a mixture of fear, concern, and hatred on their many faces. Celeste did not hesitate. She did not linger. It was the second time in less than two hours that she had been judged silently by a throng of accusatory spectators after being attacked in public, and she could not bring herself to brave through it once again. She shoved the men closest to her out of the way and moved quickly down the factory steps without looking back. She felt scared, confused, angry, and close to tears, and of all the awful things that had happened to her today, the last thing she wanted was to have people see her cry. She hurried along the cobblestone street back towards the bridge, ignoring the suspicious looks cast by the now bustling crowds that had begun to flood the area around the factory. She didn't care what they thought. She didn't care if Calmore was dead. She didn't care if she lost her job. She didn't even care if she would be accused of murder. It felt to her as if in the span of three hours she had lived through the trauma and unpleasantness of multiple lives. Everything that had happened to her today felt like a dream, a horrible dream that lingered even in the strong, warm light of day. Maybe, maybe that's all it was. There was no way that so many unnatural things could happen in such a short span of time. Perhaps she had collapsed on her way to work, and everything she had experienced was nothing more than an illusion woven into fruition by her overactive subconscious. But as she approached the bridge that she had crossed not 45 minutes ago, the memory of that encounter with Victoria Brand resurfaced in her mind, as clear and real in her mind as anything else she could recall. A nervous sweat broke over her, and her heart raced. She instinctively clutched at the necklace that still hung beneath her shirt, and was relieved to find that it remained cold and unmoving. Without willing it to do so, her mind snapped into a kind of knee-jerk compulsion to analyze this new mystery. What had happened to Brand that made her so clearly unstable? Who was she talking about when she referred to we, they, and the mortal vessel? Why did she want Celeste's necklace so badly that she was willing to kill for it? What was causing the necklace to react in such an unnatural way, almost as if it was alive? And how was Brand able to play off of Celeste's unconscious insecurities in such an acute and effective way, like she was reading her mind? Celeste shook her head, trying to dispel these unwanted questions. It was too soon to think about it again, the memory too fresh in her mind. She could still smell that awful mixture of alcohol, sweat, and salt water that hung around the woman she once knew as Victoria Brand, still feel her inhumanly strong grip upon her shoulders, still hear that horrifying voice, surely not her own, echoing in a chorus of tones that made shivers run down her spine. Celeste hurried along the bridge, now significantly more crowded than it had been when she had crossed it earlier that morning. She guessed that if Bran was still lurking somewhere beneath where she now stood, she would not attempt to attack her again with so many people around. Nevertheless, she found herself moving quickly and looking over her shoulder as she went, bracing herself as if at any moment the old woman would appear in her peripheral vision. Despite her best efforts, her mind continued to drift back to the uncomfortable experiences of the past few hours. These memories were to her consciousness like a strong magnet to a paperclip, she tried desperately to wrench her attention away from these horrible things that she had seen, the unbearable way they made her feel. But every time she thought she had pried herself away from them, the questions pulled her right back in, and she was pinned against the cold, hard reality of what had just happened. She was so preoccupied in trying to divert her thoughts from Brand and Mr. Calmore that she forgot to instruct her feet where to take her, and they carried on along an instinctual route without her awareness of where she was going. Before she had realized it, she was standing in front of the house at Benefit and Benevolent Street for the second time that day. But unlike this morning, unlike any other moment in her life, Celeste found herself not at the overgrown lawn or sitting on the curb. She was standing at the front door, and her hand was on the knob. She stared down at her fist, clenched tightly around the rusted and worn metal. She had never, not once that she could remember, gotten this close to entering the house before.
A part of her wanted to let go of the knob, to turn around and walk away like she had done on every other occasion, but that part of her was faint and distant in her mind, blocked out by her unyielded obsession to find answers. She could not explain what, but something in her head assured her that every question she ever had would become clear to her if she was only able to open this door. And suddenly, without really knowing what she was doing, her hand twisted the rusted knob. There was a creak, a click, and a sound like splintering wood as she leaned her weight against the door. Nothing else happened. She shoved again, testing the strength of the rotting oak, but it remained sealed. Her eyes drifted to the massive steel padlock that had been installed on the front latch, and she swore under her breath. How could she forget? She took a step back and glared up at the mansion that now seemed to be staring back, mockingly. Her face twisted into a scowl, and in an instant, all of the fear and resentment that had been building up within her since this morning was redirected at the house. She reached down and grabbed a piece of cracked cement and hurled it through the transom window above the door. It shattered the ornate stained glass, and Celeste heard it thud against the wood floor inside. It did not help alleviate her sense of frustration. She looked around desperately for something else heavy for her to throw, and when she could find nothing, resorted to kicking the door with as much strength as she could muster. Her foot missed its target and instead slammed full force against the solid steel of the padlock, and she swore loudly as she recoiled in pain. She was aware of the looks she was receiving now from passers-by. Benefit Street was not nearly as empty as it had been a few hours ago. She hopped on one foot as her toes throbbed with pain, all the while glaring at the pristine lock through teary eyes. Then, in a moment of clarity, she knew what she had to do. With any luck, Juno would still be asleep. The key that hung around the old woman's neck by day would be resting in its safe place alongside her bed. Celeste could sneak into her apartment, abscond with the key, and ride this newfound burst of ambition to her ultimate goal. Had it not been for everything else that she had experienced in the past few hours, being held at gunpoint, narrowly avoiding arrest, and watching a man's life end in an instant, Celeste may have thought differently. But all things considered, she concluded that stealing from her grandmother would be the least dangerous thing that would happen to her today. Sometime later, Celeste found herself at the disheveled front door of the ground-level apartment that she and her grandmother shared. The property that the apartment was a part of was actually fairly nice. It was owned by another old woman, the widow Carmen Wolina, heiress to a decently sized fortune passed down from her late husband. Carmen was a quiet, albeit kind, woman. She had known Juno for some years before her husband passed, and after his death agreed to let her and Celeste stay in the basement in exchange for a reasonable rent. Despite this relatively generous offer, the space Celeste currently lived in was nothing if not unpleasant. As she slowly and carefully opened the door, trying desperately to minimize the squeaking of its rusted hinges, she surveyed the place that she was forced to call home. Excluding a narrow grate near the ceiling on the other side of the room, there were no windows to allow light into the basement. And now the only source of luminance came from the small crack in the door as Celeste quietly made her way inside. As she closed the door behind her, she heard the familiar sounds of tiny claws scratching against the concrete floor. Though she could not see them, she had a clear image of the assuredly dozens of rats that had been congregating in the space in front of her just moments before she had entered. The things had grown bolder and bolder with every passing day that Celeste and Juno had lived there, to the point that Juno had been forced to bring home a large feral cat in order to deal with them effectively. The animal was now fast asleep on the table that stood in the center of the cramped space, but upon Celeste's approach, leapt onto its feet and began licking its paws hastily as if it was only just preparing for a thorough hunt. Nice try, she whispered to the cat, who paused mid-lick. But don't let me interrupt your nap. I'm just here for the key. Then I'm out of here. The cat stared at her with his mismatched green and brown eyes. Maybe forever, Celeste finished and she stepped lightly past the table and towards the back wall of the basement. She heard the soft thud of the cat leaping down from the table, and was only just aware of him trailing a few feet behind her as she walked. Hey, she hissed, still trying her best to keep quiet. Don't you know the expression? Curiosity killed the cat. Mind your business, or they're going to swap out curiosity with my name. The shabby old Tom froze in place, 
then sat down, still glaring at her out of the gloom with his bicolored eyes. Content that she had made her point to an animal that weighed eight pounds and didn't understand a word she was saying, she continued forward to where she now knew her grandmother was sleeping. Past a large support brick column sat a massive boiler that hissed and clunked softly. Despite the fact that it was only early October, the elderly owner of the building had already begun running heat through her house. The result was a restricted basement living space that was sweltering by day while Carmen was awake and roaming around upstairs, and freezing at night after she would turn off the heat to save money while she slept under her many warm comforters. This cycle of unprecedented warmth, however, proved valuable to Celeste at this moment. Her grandmother had acclimated to this lack of proper heating by staying awake for most of the night and sleeping from the early hours of the morning and late into the day, when the warmth of the boiler was sufficient to lull her into a heavy slumber on her dingy mattress squeezed between it and the wall. As Celeste rounded the hulking metal tank, she was forced to squint through the gloom in order to distinguish the form of her grandmother asleep in her bed. Without really being able to see it, Celeste was aware of a tiny bedside table that stood between the bed frame and the wall. There, she knew, a delicate silver chain hung around the base of an electric lamp, and on that chain was a bizarre-looking golden key, the only way inside the house at benefit and benevolent. Celeste inched her way along the minuscule space between the bed and the wall, listening closely to the sound of her grandmother's breathing. It sounded as though she was in a deep sleep. Celeste reached the small table, and, unable to face it due to a lack of room, she groped around next to her for the chain. Feeling the slight, cold metal on her fingertips, she grasped the necklace and moved it ever so slowly up the body of the lamp. She was impressed by how silently she was able to maneuver the somewhat heavy key without clinking it against the lamp. She seemed to have tapped into some long-dormant penchant for thievery, perhaps fueled by her desire to finally get answers. And there it was, just inches in front of her, quite literally the key towards a clearer understanding of her chaotic and stressful existence, and it was almost hers. Then, in an instant, the tiny corner of the basement was filled with an intense light. Celeste winced and squinted at the brightness, shielding her eyes that had just adjusted to the dark. When she was able to open them again, she found herself face to face with the barrel of a handgun, for the second time that day. Her eyes followed the arm pointing the revolver at her, and Celeste was crestfallen but unsurprised to see her grandmother, Juno Mason, at the other end of the weapon. Celeste's grandmother was old, there was no denying it, but it was clear that the years had taken a far more dramatic toll on Juno Mason than they did on most people her age. All the characteristic traits of an elderly woman were present. Her eyes were tired and set deep in her skull, heavy bags tugging at the skin below her lids. Her hair was gray and frizzy, and as Celeste knew well from her attempts to tame it, impossible to groom properly. Her skin was creased and wrinkled, particularly around her eyes and brow, for Juno was almost constantly frowning. But more noticeable than her physical signs of old age was her mental state that, in Celeste's mind, could not be dismissed as mere senility. Juno was a remarkably paranoid woman. She trusted no one, not even Celeste, and very rarely left her tiny basement apartment. On the uncommon occasion that she actually had a conversation with anyone outside of her immediate family, she was both defensive and accusatory in her tone, not to mention intentionally rude. Most unsettling of all was her insistence on keeping a 45 caliber Beretta Laramie revolver on her person at all times. She had a habit of producing it abruptly and without warning, much to Celeste's disliking, and had even discharged it on a handful of occasions, claiming that someone had attempted to attack her. This predisposition for drawing a weapon first and asking questions later had desensitized Celeste to the sensation of having a gun pointed at her face, but the memory of Brand and her threat from this morning was brought suddenly back into the forefront of her mind. You may be surprised to hear that you're not the first crazy old lady to hold me at gunpoint today, Grandma. Celeste told the gun, not meeting Juno's eyes. Yeah? Did you try to steal her personal property too? Juno snatched the chain out of Celeste's hand. She did not resist. All of the adrenaline that had fueled her unprecedented sense of daring had worn off the instant Juno switched on the light, and she felt herself reverting back into a little girl preparing to be reprimanded by an adult.
No, actually, the opposite. But thank you for your concern. I'm fine, by the way. Celeste was now moving out of the crack between the bed and the wall, and Juno had swung her legs around the side of the bed and was hoisting herself onto the floor with some effort. Even when standing, the old woman barely reached Celeste's chest, and yet the fury in her eyes gave the impression of a bear just woken from hibernation and hungry for flesh. She grumbled as she put on her tiny spectacles, not releasing her grip on either the gun or the key. She then proceeded to clasp the chain around her wrinkled neck, at which point she jabbed the revolver at Celeste again and demanded, What in the hell are you trying to do with my key? Your ass should be parked over at the Tom's plant right now. You better have a damn good reason for being here, waking me up before I get my eight hours. Celeste wished that she could blame her grandmother's temper on a lack of proper sleep, but she knew that even if she had met her awake and refreshed, there would be no difference in the way she reacted. She rolled her eyes and stalked away from Juno, pretending to search for something on the other side of the room where her mattress lay. Well, you got cotton in your ears, girl. I asked you a question. What is so goddamn important about my key that it's taking you from the job I traded my last shred of goodwill in for so that you could finally make something out of yourself in this town? Celeste spun around. Her hair, which had been tied up in a tight knot earlier that morning, was starting to unravel, and wild black curls were starting to fall in her face. Oh, that job was your idea of a gift to me, was it? She snapped back, finally helping me live my dream of becoming an engineer by having me stand in an assembly line for 12 hours a day just so some corrupt old white man can harass me relentlessly while I knowingly build faulty auto parts. Really generous of you, Juno. Thank you so much. She almost never spoke to her grandmother this way, but after everything she had been through today, she had no more patience to be spoken to like an ungrateful child. Don't you raise your voice at me, girl. My name is Celeste, you withered old bat! Celeste interjected, and her grandmother, for the first time Celeste could ever remember, looked at a loss for words. If one more person calls me girl today, I swear I'm gonna... She looked around, her hands clenched and raised to her chest. Without finishing her initial thought, she went on. My name is Celeste Mason. You may not remember, but my mother gave me that name. My mother, a woman who cared about me and for some inexplicable reason cared about you. But you took that for granted, didn't you, Juno? Juno stared open-mouthed at Celeste. It was obvious that she was not prepared for this level of aggression in response to the questions she had asked her granddaughter, but Celeste received a malicious twinge of satisfaction in the reaction she was provoking in Juno. They never, less frequently even than they spoke about the house at Benefit and Benevolent, ever brought up the subject of Celeste's mother. In fact, Celeste was unsure if what she was saying was even true. For all she knew, her mother may have died the moment she was born. She could have left when she was just a baby, too afraid to raise a child without a husband. But regardless of the legitimacy of her claim, Celeste felt like she, for the first time in as long as she could remember, was in control of an argument with her grandmother, and she continued. Sure, you thought that everything you did was to protect us, right? Keep us away from the judging eyes of the public. Don't touch the money, stay away from the house, and keep out of trouble. If we don't profit from Dor's death, they might stop accusing you of murder. Is that what you thought all these years? Is that why you kept me from having a real life, living like a normal kid? Your fear of what other people might think of you? Juno opened and closed her mouth several times, but no words came out. She had lowered her handgun and was now staring at the floor. Celeste thought she heard her mumble something under her breath. That's not why. It's too dangerous. Dangerous? shouted Celeste over her grandmother's soft words. You haven't set foot in that old place since the day door died, Juno. I bet the only dangerous thing about that house is the damn padlock you put on the door. She hopped on one foot removing her shoe and sock and pointing at her now bruised and swollen toe. Without bothering to replace her missing shoes, she stamped her bare foot on the cold cement floor. You let fear control every part of your life, Grandma. It's become who you are. I bet there was a woman under there that a daughter could love, that a man could care for, but she's long gone, isn't she? You've replaced her with a paranoid old hag that would sooner pull a gun on her granddaughter than ask her about her day. Juno said nothing. She was still staring at her feet, motionless and silent. I've got news for you, Juno, 
Celeste went on, hastily pulling a sock over her bare foot and struggling to lace her boot without looking away from her grandmother. You keep it up like this, and you'll have no one left in your life willing to put up with it. It's what made my mother leave, it's why Grandpa died sad and afraid, and now... She turned and marched towards the door. She wrenched it open, scattering dust and bits of debris around the room as sunlight flooded the dark basement. You'll lose me, too. Because of all of the things you hide from, of all of the things you felt you needed to protect yourself against, the one thing you never feared was driving me away. Celeste swept out the door, slamming it behind her as she stormed off into the blinding sun. The door bounced back open from the force at which it was closed and swung slowly on its rusted hinges, leaving Juno standing half-shrouded in darkness and staring vacantly out into the remaining crack of light.